Galatians chapter 5, reading in verse 22 and verse 23 again tonight. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Heavenly Father, again tonight, as we come before Thee, we ask, Lord, for Your blessing to be upon the reading of Thy Word. We ask again here this evening, Lord, that You would speak to our hearts. And Lord, help us to truly be attentive to Thy Word and the leading of Thy Spirit. And Lord, help us to truly understand the difference between walking in the flesh and the works of the flesh and walking in the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. And we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this is our 11th message in this chapter, and we're going to take two words from verse 22. And that is long-suffering and gentleness. Now last week we looked at joy and peace. And I mentioned to you each week in the last couple of weeks that the fruit of the Spirit is that which the Holy Spirit produces supernaturally. It has nothing to do with human efforts. And in John 15 verses 1 through 16 we find that the Lord said that we must abide in Him. The branches cannot bear fruit without the vine. We also considered 2 Peter 1.8, we are not to be barren or unfruitful. And then in Matthew 7, verse 17 through 20, the tree is known by its fruit. Now notice in verse 22, and we can turn loose of this verse, once we read verse 22 again, well, let me just take the two words from this verse. We're going to consider tonight the word long-suffering and the word gentleness. And I'll ask you to go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's first of all consider long-suffering. Now, we have other sermons associated with some of these um, uh characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, but we want to camp out here for a while and so that we can truly uh, learn something from this. A short answer for long-suffering is suffering long. Now, the reason I say that, the word is basically made up of two Greek words, meaning long and temper. So it also means long-tempered. And uh, it has the ideal, I'm going to give you several synonyms, but it has the ideal of patience, being slow to anger, long-tempered, not short-tempered. It's the ability to gracefully bear the unbearable, the quality of being injured without anger or revenge or retaliation. It has the ideal of self-restraint, and again, to have a long fuse, not have a short fuse. Now, that's the basic ideal of this word. It is the opposite of being short-tempered. I've known many over the years uh, who are short-tempered, and uh, they're easy to be stirred to anger and retaliation. Um, I've had a relative one time, that uh, his anger brought him to the place of uh, going to the doctor, and he thought it was something else, dealing with his blood pressure and everything else. And the doctor told him, you don't need medicine. He said, you've got to deal with your temper, and you've got to deal with your anger and your wrath. And so uh, he began trying to work on that. And a preacher friend of mine, we were friends for a number of years, was also very short-fused. We've sat down and talked about that many, many times. I watched him and his dealings with others and, and whatever, and he's just very, very short-fused. The last time I seen him, which is about maybe a year ago, uh, and he was just explosive, not to me, 
but about what was going on with his the country. He was mad at everybody in Washington, D.C. And I said, well, why don't you get right with God and you don't have to worry about what all the politicians are doing. And you won't have to be short-fused all the time. He's, and uh, But anyway, notice here, and let's take as many verses as we can tonight. And let me tell you something. What we're going to be looking at here with these um, uh, characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit is just as important as any other doctrine in the Bible. It, it really is. Because this is the key to our peace, our joy, uh, our happiness. This is the key to us being faithful to the Lord and walking with Him. So I hope that you'll take each of these very, very seriously. And notice now, uh, as we come here to Ephesians, I'm going to go through as many verses as I can. Uh, some of these are a little repetitious, but uh, if if I need them, to go back over them and over and over them again, I think possibly some of you might need them as well. Well, notice in Ephesians 4, I'm reading the first three verses, and we're looking now for the word long-suffering or the word patience. And he said here in verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy, notice of the vocation, uh, wherewith your call. We have a profession, a vocation. Uh, we have a calling. And he says here, here's how we're to walk. And notice uh, the verses we're going to be looking at tonight and even into next week and the following week. Notice how several similar words are linked together. And he said, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we have several words here. Long-suffering is linked with lowliness and meekness and also forbearing one another. You say, what does it mean to forbear with one another? Put up with one another, love one another, and, uh, and be kind to one another. You'll notice also as we come down into this chapter, you notice with me in verse 32, or I'm sorry, verse 22, there's some things to put off and there's some things to put on. And he says here in, in this passage, uh, and, and by the way, as I read just a few verses, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but we find here that we're to put off the old self, which belonged to our former life, which is corrupt and deceitful. And we're to put on that which is produced by the Holy Spirit, as we're reading in Galatians 5. We're to put on the new man. The Bible speaks of this new man as a new nature in 2 Peter 1 and in verse 4. And he says here in verse 22 that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is cropped according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, we're talking about the flesh contrast of the spirit. And he said in verse 24 that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, and then he begins giving a list of things that we're to put away. Turn with me to Colossians while we're here close. In Colossians chapter 1, first of all, we read in Colossians last week dealing with peace and joy. In Colossians chapter 1, notice in beginning in verse 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul prayed for the saints to be long-suffering. And he said, this is the will of God. Verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, why do we need this? Verse 10, That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Then he says in verse 11, Strengthen with all might according to his, his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. We find the word patience and long suffering here. Paul is praying that the saints at Colossae would have spiritual understanding that they would be pleasing to God, that they would walk worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way and some of the ways that we can do this 
is that we are to be long-suffering, we're to be patient. Turn away to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12 to verse 14. If you're taking notes, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14 and 15 says, Be patient toward all men, and render not evil for evil unto any man. I didn't quote the entire two verses, but I picked out uh, what we're looking at here tonight. The issue of patience and not rendering evil uh, for evil. Verse 12, notice here. He said, put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Again, we have this putting off, verse 8. Putting off, verse 9. Putting on, verse 10. Verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. Now notice the words. The word kindness is going to be related to our next word in a few moments, gentleness. And notice the words that are connected together here. He says, Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and here's our word, long-suffering. And he continues and said, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. We also looked at charity or love a few weeks back. Well, now turn with me to Second Peter. Notice with me in Second Peter. And I want you to notice that this long-suffering is an attribute of God. Second Peter chapter 3. If we want to imitate God, then we're to be long-suffering. It's an attribute of God. And there's many Old Testament passages that bear this out. For instance, Exodus 34.6. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 15, and there's many others. Romans 2 verse 4 also speaks of this. And there's a passage in Romans 10 uh, verse, let me make sure I give you the right verse. It's an interesting verse because the Lord is speaking about Israel as a whole, as a nation. And uh, in verse 1, 2, and 3 is speaking Israel, they had a zeal, but not according knowledge. And then in verse 19, 20, 21, he mentions the fact that the, that the majority of the Jews did not believe on the Messiah. But verse 21 says this, But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gangsaying people. All day long, for probably 1,500 years, from Exodus to the book of Acts, he has stretched forth his hands to redeem this nation. And he says that they were a disobedient and a gangsaying people. And so, was God long-suffering with the nation of Israel? I would say yes. He chased them many times, and still yet he sent the Messiah to that nation. And many of them rejected, some received, but he was very long-suffering with the nation of Israel. Now, we know that God is long-suffering with all. He was long-suffering with Sodom, but it came a time when He dealt with Sodom. He was long-suffering with Israel, but there came a time when God had to judge them. In Romans 1, He was long-suffering with the nations. And still yet, there was a time when the Lord uh, judged the nations. So let's look in Second Peter chapter 3. First of all, notice with me in verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. It said here, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has been long-suffering with humanity for many, many years. Also, notice with me in verse 15. In verse 15, it says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. And Paul speaks of the long suffering of God in 1 Timothy 1 and in verse 16 
and that uh, He Himself would even be a pattern unto those who would be saved. In other words, God was very long-suffering to Saul of Tarsus, who later became known as Paul the Apostle. We'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12. And again, we could go to many, many Old Testament passages and, and look at this, but uh, I want to consider both of these words here tonight. We find that long-suffering was also an attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord was prophesied to come in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through about 4, especially verse 3, we find that, that, he would, um, that He would be humble, that He would be meek, that He would be long-suffering and patient. And He demonstrated His long-suffering while He was here upon this earth. He demonstrated His long-suffering and patience with sinners. And we see that as we look through the Gospel. I think about some of the stories in the four Gospels uh, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. The Lord purposely took the time to minister to this woman. He purposely took His time to minister to the lepers and, and to the woman that was taken in adultery in John chapter 8. The Lord demonstrated His long-suffering in His patience to sinners while here upon this earth, and He's still doing that today. Well, notice in Matthew chapter 12, and I'm reading in verses 18 through 21. Now, this is taken, this is a prophecy taken from Isaiah 42, the beginning of that chapter. Behold my servant, this is a reference to Christ, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Notice he'll bring the gospel, the truth to them. He shall not strive. In other words, he's not going to be a rebel. Nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. He will not be protesting and so forth. Notice a bruised reed shall he not break. A reed is like a cane or a stalk. And this here, a bruised reed, he shall not break. In other words, a bruised reed represents that a weak things, and Christ did not crush, but he had compassion. He was long suffering, he was gentle, he was patient. And a smoking flax he shall not quench. In other words, he would not put out the flame till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. And so we see it was prophesied that Christ, when he come, he would be gentle, that he would be long-suffering, and he would be patient. And as we look through the Gospels, we see that his ministry, that way the Christ, the Lord Jesus, he was firm, and he spoke the truth and spoke the word, but he had a compassion and love for others, and he was willing to take his time and minister to them and to be a part of their life. Turn with me, please, to uh, uh, to First Thessalonians chapter uh, one. First Thessalonians chapter one. Now I want to give you three saints in the Bible that we find that it speaks of their patience, and one of them is Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 6. You can write that down. The Apostle Paul is speaking to them and speaking of the things that he went through for them. And he mentions in, in the, his ministry and the ministers. And he says in verse 5 and 6, "...in stripes and imprisonments, tumults and labors, and watching and fastings, and by pureness, by knowledge, and he says, and by long suffering, he said, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. So the Apostle Paul was a very patient man. We would read about that again as he 
teaches Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 10 and 11, and also in chapter 4 and in verse 2. We find another man that was very patient. You can write this down. And his name is Abraham. And uh, we could go back in the Old Testament and study him. But Hebrews chapter 6, verses 12 through 15 tells us that he received the promises of God. God had made promises to him, and he trusted the Lord. The Bible actually says in verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Abraham was a man of long-suffering and patience. And one other I'll give you, and that is in James chapter 5, And this has to do with Job. Patience and long-suffering is a quality of great price. How many could say amen? It's a great quality. And it is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And we find that God is the source of long-suffering through the Holy Spirit. And in James chapter 5, I'm going to read in 1 Thessalonians in just a moment. Now I've already turned loose of it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm going to read there in just a moment. But we find that in James 5, verses 7 through 14, the Bible speaks of the patience of Job. The patience of Job. I don't know of anybody that's went through any more than Job went through. And the man was patient. Yes, he spoke to God and, and he hurt and he was in pain. But he trusted the Lord as you read through that. He uses him as an example. I'll tell you something else too that you you can make note of. And that will be in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Charity. The Bible says, You suffereth long. We're talking about long-suffering and patience. And I'm I'm going to remind you that he says in chapter 12, verse 31, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto unto you rather a more excellent way. The more excellent way is charity. Charity outranks all of the spiritual gifts that are given to the church. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now by the faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And we find that charity, let me, let me come back here. Now, I want you to listen to this. We got both thoughts here tonight with long suffering and gentleness. In other words, patience and kindness. And I want to read verse four again. It said, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. We could spend the rest of our life working on some of these verses. All right, now notice in 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians. So God is the source of long-suffering and patience. And again, it is a fruit of the Spirit. In order to walk in the Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit, we can do this. Let me give you a quote by another author. Speaking of heroes. And he says, heroes in our society are portrayed in the media as angry and aggressive and defenders of democracy. That's the heroes in America today. That's the heroes. But it's not the heroes in the Word of God. Those who are long-suffering and gentle and meek, and lowly. These are the heroes of God. Well, notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we find here in verse 3, Paul is giving thanks in verse 2, and he says in verse 3, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love, notice, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. And I'll just stop reading there. I read this because we see the beginnings of this church. There was great patience among the people of God. 
Now let's come to the word gentleness. Uh, turn with me please to Titus. You're there close. Titus chapter 3. What does it mean when we see the word gentleness? Well, it's the quality of being gentle. Let me give you some synonyms. And I want you to think about these. You see, religion does not make us sour. Pure religion does not make us sour. And we have a lot of rudeness and harshness in our world that we live in. And that should never be in our lives as Christians. Here's some synonyms of gentleness. Kindness, and we see that we see that many times throughout the scripture. Courtesy, tenderness. Some people say, well, these shouldn't be in a man's life. Oh, yes, they should, as much as anyone else. Sweetness. Now, let me stop there just for a moment. Had a brother that visited here one time, and he was from Ohio. He was trying to pastor a church in uh, Pikeville, Tennessee, right across the mountain from my hometown in Dayton. And um, I forget how we heard about him. My wife and I were in Tennessee, been a number of years ago. Crossed the mountain and went over and visited with him just a little bit. And um, and we came home, and within a period of time, they came here. I think they've been here twice now. And uh, I don't think they ever really got the church going uh, there. Uh, he was there for a good while, and he ended up going back to Ohio. And But anyway, he sat with me one time and he said one of the hardest balances that he has in his life and as a preacher, as a minister, is to be firm with the truths of God's Word. And he used this word, he said, and to be sweet at the same time. I have never forgotten that. He wanted that balance, and we all should want it, to be firm and still yet have a sweetness about us. Another synonym is is mildness. Another synonym is softness and also respect. Gentleness. This is an interesting word. How many know what a gentle horse is? I mean, we don't have to go very far to really get a good definition. A gentle horse is a horse that don't bite, buck, kick and have an attitude. I mean, we I was raised up around horses and mules and jennies and donkeys and ponies and uh, we had them all and we used them for to ride and to pull wagons and and you can get horses and mules with attitudes. And you can get some that will kick and bite and buck. How many has ever been thrown off of a horse? Am I the only ones that have been thrown? Okay, we've got two of us here that's been thrown off of a horse. I've been thrown off of many times. Me and my cousins used to try to break horses. We've even done it for other people. I quit that at a certain age. That's kind of silly. To purposely get on one knowing that you're going to be thrown off. And uh, But anyway, and another thing, not only a gentle horse, we know what gentleness means, but what about a gentle breeze? We know what a gentle breeze is. That is a breeze. What what would we get? Five to ten miles per hour, maybe. I don't. You know, a nice gentle breeze. We had one here this past week when our friends was down from South Carolina. We would went to Pensacola to visit with our friend there. We also stopped on the island over here and just walked and just a nice little gentle breeze. Something that's pleasant. Amen. We know what that means. Notice in Titus. I'm reading uh, in verse chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. This is the Apostle Paul writing to Titus as a preacher, encouraging him, showing him what to live and what to preach. And he said in verse 1, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and to obey magistrates and to be ready to every good work. Now notice the next two verses. He said to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, that's, fighting and arguing. What's the next word but what? Gentle. Gentle. And then he says, showing all meekness and all men. Now notice he talks about our past. But we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, 
deceived, serving divers, that means many lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envying, hateful and hating one another. And then verse 4, 5, 6, and 7 speaks of our regeneration and our salvation and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so here's a good passage with this. Turn with me to James in the book of James chapter 3 this time. James chapter 3, I'm going to pick a reading up in verse 13. Let's see this word again. If you're taking notes tonight, 2 Samuel 18.5, you get an idea of what this word means. It is the um, gentleness is the opposite of harshness. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 54 and 56, it's the opposite of baseness. And in Proverbs 15.1, it is the opposite of hardness or rudeness. Let me give an example of that. Some of you can finish the verse in Proverbs 51. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So that's the idea of the word gentle. This also is an attribute of God as well as long-suffering. There's one passage that really stands out to me, and that's Isaiah 40, verse 11. It says there in that passage that He gently leads His lambs. God is gentle. He's very, very gentle. And we're going to look in a moment that the Lord Jesus is very gentle. And He leads His lambs. We're sheep. We're lambs. We're children of God. And... uh, You'll notice now in James chapter 3. By the way, Psalms 18.35, I believe it is. David said, and it's also quoted in 2 Samuel 22.36. David said, Thy gentleness has made me great. So it had an effect upon David. The gentleness of God. James chapter 3, I'm reading from verse... 13. Notice here in verse 13 through 18. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, now there's two types of wisdom here. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. In other words, it's out of hell. He said, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But here's another wisdom from above. Verse 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Notice, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good work, good fruits rather, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We keep seeing these words. Lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. All of these words are connected together. And here's the thing in this chapter. He illustrates this here. See, we have a wisdom that is from above, that is gentle, But strife and confusion and bitter, envying and all of that is from below. It's devilish, it's earthly, it's sensual. And when we back up into this chapter, he speaks about the tongue. This is one of the uh, ways that we are unkind and are not very long-suffering and are not gentle. In verse 6, he said, The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therefore bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. By the way, every time we curse man, we're cursing God. We hate man, we're hating God. 
And he said, And out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and, and curses. He said, My brethren, these things ought not so to be. And he illustrates it in the following verses. Turn with me please to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians said, I'm going to use this and Thessalonians, and we're going to go back and read one verse in Colossians, and we'll close. Some quotes by a few other authors. Gentleness is viewed by many in our society as weakness, soft, or spineless, but it is strength under control accompanied by calmness and peace. Another author said, gentleness is a strong hand with a soft touch. Another writer said, true followers are distinguished as gentle. True followers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and one on rudeness. Rudeness is the weak man's imitation of strength. And there's a lot of rudeness and harshness in our world today. And it seems like this generation we have now has been one of the most rudest generations of all time. People are just rude. They're short-tempered. They're rude. They're crude. And, uh, and don't really have much of anything good to say most of the time. Well, notice with me as we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The Apostle Paul appealed to the believers at Corinth by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. We're going to see two words connected together here again. He says in chapter 10, 2 Corinthians 10, 1, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you, notice by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in the presence, who in presence rather am base, among you, in other words, he's as a servant, but being absent and bold, Toward you. We see here the meekness and the gentleness of Christ placed in one verse. Let's go to two more passages. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 this time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and then we'll turn back to Colossians 3. So it is very manly to be gentle. Can I get an amen? In other words, let me put it this way, real men are gentle. Anybody can be a pig-headed man, you know, and rude and crude and rough and all that, but real men, godly men, are gentle. Now notice, let's look at how Paul defines this. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading verses 6, 7, and 8, and another, write down 1 Timothy 2, 24, because the Apostle Paul speaks to Timothy about being a teacher and also uses this word uh, gentle. But notice here the Apostle Paul defines gentleness as a nurse or as a mother cherishes her children. I'm reading from verse 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle. You ought to highlight some of these words so they'll just jump out at you every time you read them. This is the Apostle Paul. This is like Peter speaking of things that are precious. Paul said, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children, as a nursing mother with her children. And he said in verse 8, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. You know what Paul is saying? He's saying we were gentle. We were gentle. We were as a nursing mother with a child when we ministered unto you. That's an amazing statement. Turn with me to one last passage. We're going to read Colossians 3.12 again. We're going to see the word kindness. Kindness. That's 
like being gentle. Kindness can only be cultivated by the Spirit of God. And keep in mind, we are called sheep and lambs. We are not called wolves and bears and bulls. We're sheep and we're lambs. And as far as I can tell, God chose a sheep or a lamb to represent His people because they're gentle and they're harmless. Notice as we read in Colossians chapter 3, and one last time, let us read verse 12. He said, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. Here's the word. Now we got both faults in this one verse. We've done read this once. Kindness, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and then last of all, verse 12, long suffering. So we need to cultivate fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We need to walk in the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, and we need to bear fruit in our lives. And the only way to bear that fruit is to be closely connected to the vine. Would you stand with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee, Lord, this evening for the privilege to be able to assemble together again tonight. Thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You for the indwelling Holy Spirit. We thank You for the privilege to be able to serve You this day and come together and worship. And we ask now Your blessings upon the remaining of the service.